1909, Boston, Massachusetts had already amassed nearly 200 years of American history. One of the earliest self-governing colonies of the New World, the city was founded with strict beliefs in Christianity and education. The Boston Tea Party and the Boston Massacre had already earned this expanding city its place in the history of America. On January 19, 1809, Edgar Poe joined Boston's population of 30,000. Born in a lodging house, the second son to Elizabeth Arnold Hopkins Poe and David Poe Jr., both members of a local repertory theater. David was a drunkard and a gambler, leaving Elizabeth, a victim of tuberculosis, with all their financial responsibility. In late 1809, David disappeared in the night and was never heard from again. In December of 1811, Elizabeth died of consumption, a complication of her tuberculosis. Her children were separated, and Edgar went to live with Mr. and Mrs. John Allen. The Allens, a rather wealthy family, doted on Edgar. They dressed him well and made sure he wanted for nothing. Edgar met his first love, his schoolmate's mother, Jane Stith Craig Stannard. She sympathized with his troubles of being a fostered child, and he took to her strongly. She was the source of some of his first two Helen poems. Within a year of meeting her, she suffered a complete mental breakdown and died of consumption, leaving Edgar devastated and heartbroken. He found love again years later and became unofficially engaged to Sarah Elmira Royster, his neighbor. Her father did not approve of his lack of wealth and stature and would not permit the marriage. Edgar wrote to her often, but his letters were intercepted by her father. Under the assumption that she had been forgotten, Sarah soon became married to another man and Edgar was once again brokenhearted. At 18, Edgar enlisted in the Army after a short stint at the University of Virginia Charlottesville and an even shorter period of working with his foster father. He did well in the Army, achieving the title of Regimental Sergeant Major. While in the Army, his first book, Tamerlane and Other Poems by a Bostonian, was published. Shortly thereafter, Francis Allen, his loving foster mother, died of illness. He then requested and was granted discharge from the army, and went to live in Baltimore with the Clem family, where his brother Henry resided, along with his Aunt Maria Clem, whom the family called Muddy, his young cousin Virginia Clem, and grandmother Poe, his father's mother, whose pension was all the entire family had to live on. Resting on these provisions, Edgar settled in and continued to write and submit his work. While in Baltimore, Edgar's works began to get published in newspapers and magazines, and reviews were beginning to appear in some large market newspapers. Things were looking up for him, and love was once again in the air as he took notice of his young cousin and housemate, Virginia. Within the year, Henry Poe died of tuberculosis, leaving Edgar with another death to haunt his soul and a new title as Man of the House. In 1833, he won first prize in a writing contest with Manuscript in a Bottle. The cash prize of $50 made him a paid writer for the first time, and he found a friend in John Pendleton Kennedy, one of the contest judges. Kennedy would give Edgar some small loans, a horse, plus many opportunities to publish his work in the Southern Literary Messenger. In these publications, he was encouraged to write science fiction pieces as if they were true. He did such a good job that many readers were fooled into thinking that the stories were true, a feat that would not be repeated for over a century until Orson Welles' legendary War of the Worlds broadcast that sent its listeners into a frenzy. Edgar's relationship with John Allen, his foster father, was a tense one. On his deathbed, Mr. Allen threatened to strike Edgar with his cane should he come to pay his respects. 
Edgar kept his distance, and in March of 1834, John Allen passed away, leaving Edgar nothing at all for inheritance. In the summer of 1835, Grandmother Poe died and the pension ceased, leaving Edgar no means of regular income. At Kennedy's suggestion, Edgar moved his Aunt Muddy and cousin Virginia to Richmond, where he assumed the position as editor at The Messenger, after meeting and quickly forming a friendship with its owner, Mr. White. Shortly thereafter, a distant cousin of the Poe family began action to obtain custody of the teenage Virginia. To cease their efforts and to keep what was left of his family together, Edgar asked his Aunt Muddy for Virginia's hand in marriage. Muddy quickly approved and the newly engaged Edgar found some happiness in his young fiancé, but found his job unfavorable and the constant financial strain difficult to bear. He became very depressed and began drinking excessively, calling himself a victim of melancholy. Eventually, he was fired from the messenger for his inability to show up to work sober. The pressure of being unemployed forced Edgar to clean up his act. He slowed his drinking considerably, kept himself presentable, and was generally more responsible. He finally acquired a marriage license, and then he and Virginia were married in a simple ceremony. He was 27, and she was 16. Mr. White attended the ceremony, and seeing that Edgar was getting his life in order, asked him back as editor of The Messenger. Soon, Edgar was running the paper himself, as Mr. White tended to his wife, who was dying of cancer. The new responsibility was bittersweet, as it brought no additional income, and the extra workload was a lot for him to bear, leaving no time for him to work on his writing, which had been providing a supplemental income. His drinking increased, and to counteract the effects of the alcohol, he began to regularly use laudanum, a form of opium. Eventually, the effects of his habits led to him again being terminated from the messenger. Under Edgar's editorial guidance, the paper had grown from 700 subscriptions to over 5,000. With no work to be had, Edgar moved his family to New York City, where they found a small place in Greenwich Village. Only surviving on occasional small jobs, he found time and inspiration in New York and was finally able to concentrate on his writing. In 1838, he landed a position as a literary critic with Gentleman's Magazine for $10 a week. His critiques were sometimes harsh, but always honest and reflective, and so he began to be well-respected in the literary world as a critic. While writers were working hard to get him to read their work, to get his opinion published, Edgar continued to create his own material. It was Gentleman's Magazine that first published The Fall of the House of Usher, and some of his other now well-known stories. Before long, Gentleman's was bought by George R. Graham, and the magazine became known as Graham's. One of Graham's first issues featured a new story by Edgar, The Murders in the Rue Morgue. The story was very well received. It was the first of its kind, a detective story. The genre is still in great use today and was the predecessor for many great cultural icons, from Sherlock Holmes to Columbo. Virginia had a very pleasant singing voice, and for entertainment, she and Edgar gathered their friends and family to socialize, and she would sing for them. On one such winter day in 1842, as she was singing a popular hymn, Virginia began hemorrhaging from the mouth. (coughs) The experience was a traumatic one and marked the beginning of her long illness. Edgar spent all that he could manage to get a proper diagnosis, but the truth became evident quickly. It was what he and Muddy feared, tuberculosis. For the next few years, Edgar, Virginia, and Muddy would move several times, as Edgar would jump from magazine to magazine. His work continued to be published, and it became very well known. In January of 1845, The Raven was published in the Evening Mirror. It was his first nationwide publication, and very quickly began to see publication overseas as well. In 
Nevermore became a catchword of the time, and people were calling Edgar himself the Raven. He had arrived, or so it seemed. He entrusted in a friend later in the same year that he was in the worst financial shape he had ever been in. The constant struggle between rising fame and declining finances mixed with Virginia's failing health kept Edgar in a state of stress and misery. He began to suffer his own bouts of illness, spending sometimes many days at a time in bed. His use of alcohol and laudanum were continuous and seemingly unstoppable. He worked hard and wrote diligently, almost always while intoxicated. While many thought him to be vain and rude, those close to him knew him to be troubled and depressed, but kind-hearted and friendly. His love for Virginia was pure, and she was the one true source of whatever happiness he knew. On January 13, 1847, Virginia Poe died of consumption. She was 25 years old. Edgar was grief-stricken. His torment was incredible. But always a writer, he continued to pour his soul into his literature. His first work after Virginia's passing was Eulalie, which was written for her. A few months later, Edgar found himself in a terrible state of health. He was diagnosed with a brain lesion and could not take medications for it without experiencing adverse reactions. While it only made it worse, his only relief was through alcohol. In between attacks of sickness, he continued to work towards publications and writing new material. In the first days of October 1849, he disappeared on his way to New York from Richmond. A few days later, he was found on the streets of Baltimore, absolutely delirious and wearing someone else's worn-out clothing and a straw hat. He was placed immediately in Washington College Hospital in Baltimore. In the days that followed, he maintained his delirium and was never lucid enough to explain what had brought this fever upon him. On Sunday, October 7, 1849, before dawn, a witness said that Edgar uttered something, Lord, help my poor soul, just before drawing his final breath. Edgar Allan Poe was dead at the age of 40. The exact cause of death remains a mystery. It was speculated that it was complications from the lesion in his brain, his excessive alcoholism, or a combination of the two, but a precise cause of death was never recorded. News traveled quickly about his death and the mystery which surrounded it. In life, Edgar was a mystifying character. Once he had passed on, he became legend. Interest in his work reached new heights, and readers' demand brought on new publications. Large volumes of collections of his work would surface over the following decades. The literary world would never be the same. To this day, Edgar's stories, poems, and direct influence over literature, music, theater, and film are supremely evident. In life, he strived for success with the idea that someone could write for a living. He chased the idea straight to his deathbed, never knowing that his efforts and talents were paving the way for the eternal success of his own works and opportunities for every storyteller that came after him. In this way, Edgar was able to make an immeasurable difference. If he could see the world today, he could see his influence in nearly every corner of the earth, and he might finally feel what he had searched for his entire life happiness.